Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder, uh, December 13th, <coughs> excuse me, 2012, sorry for the cough. You may hear a few more before this is over. Uh, somebody sent me this book today, and I'm sure others may have sent it to me in the past. And forgive me, because a lot of times if I don't mention it, they say, hey, I sent you that before. I just now looked at this particular one, because yeah, it's a, a treatise on the suits in chancery and uh, the jurisprudence of equity and it was written by Henry G. Gibson who was a chancellor of second chancery division of Tennessee yeah, Henry was a chancellor he may know something about chancery so you could download this book if you were so inclined you could just go to archive.org a-r-c-h-i-v-e dot org put in a treatise on suits and chancery you may find other ones to look at uh, this one is by Henry R. Gibson and since uh, so I just want to read a few pages out of this but before we go there since we're talking about books here's another good one The Order of the Coif uh, by Alexander Pulling P-U-L-L-I-N-G who was a sergeant at law writing about sergeants at law and a sergeants at law that if they're sergeant at law long enough may someday become the chancellor but all the chief justices um, or uh, judges on the uh, common pleas bench all, all these judges were sergeants at law first and then you know they became a judge or they became a chancellor or they became a justice but first they were a sergeant at law and a sergeant at law is a man learned in the law as opposed to an attorney who's practicing to be learned in the law he just stopped his practicing or he just stopped learning and decided to practice and that's who you go to normally so <laughs> um, there's not a lot of these sergeants at law there, there never has been but um, this book uh, just to show you because really it's the first chapter that the the introduction is you know yeah more about ceremony and so forth but law and lawyers before Edward the first and then uh, uh, chapter two is about how the uh, the courts were um, became involved the king's justice and common bench the assize you know these are that this is the basis of what our laws are supposed to be based on because here in America, right, we're supposed to, our laws are based on the laws of England. Well, this is the history of the laws of England. And the Chief Justicar is a powerful dude. I think he still exists, we just don't see him. But there's a Chief Justicar out there someplace. <laughs> and there's also a Chancellor, and that's why there's chanceries. And you want to take your case into a court of. Chancery, and so this chancellor, back in uh, this book was written, I think in nineteen, what did I say, nineteen seventeen, nineteen oh seven, okay, and so this is what the man had to say: <coughs> the civil law, its development, the system of jurisprudence called equity, was originally largely derived from the civil law of the Romans. And its early development in England was similar to the development of an analogous system of jurisprudence of Rome. Therefore, in endeavoring to trace the origin of the Chancery Court, it may be well to notice briefly the development of the civil law. A little sidebar, right? Like the third century, uh, the Christians, the, the, the emperor became a Christian, and he made ecclesiastic law public law and he put the bishops in charge and the bishops developed the system we call equity yeah these are those Roman Catholic bishops we're talking about and uh, they showed up in England about the fifth century well when they got to England there were already Christians here they had come from Scotland and the theory is right that uh, at the great Pentecost when all the apostles went their own way well eventually some of them ended up in Scotland some went to Rome it's said that uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, the Black Madonna ended up in France. 
um, with another Mary and some other people, and you know they they spread the word of uh, the Christian religion all over. <laughs> about about the fifth century, uh, the first bishop from Rome. He wasn't the bishop of Rome, but from Rome was sent to England to start a, um, you know, to start the religion there. And he gets there, hey, there's already Christians here. And I think they knew this because this is, you know, that England and Rome had a road between them, right? That Rome had had this whole system all over the Europe for hundreds of years, and they had a very good, efficient law system. It, it's just the old law system was really um, not geared for the common folk. And all the Christians is they took it and they tweaked it. And so instead of being able to be accused without the accuser taking an oath, they said, well, if you want to accuse somebody, you know, take an oath and bring in two witnesses. That was a big change. Well, if you're not willing to do that, you know, there won't be very many lawsuits. <laughs> but continuing on, uh, the early laws of Rome, like the old common law of England, were exceedingly stern, rigid, formally formal and arbitrary, paying little attention to the abstract right and justice. <laughs> Didn't seem to care about justice. That would be the old pagan Roman law. Their judicial proceedings were technical to the last degree. Absolute accuracy was required in complying with an established phases of acts and the enforcement of civil rights. Any omission or mistake or word or a movement was fatal. Right? Anything would tip your case over. As civilization, Christianity, however progressed in Rome, subtle technicalities gave way to simpler methods of pleading, but even then it was found that cases occasionally rose to which the improved formulas were inadequate. These extraordinary cases were decided by a pra praetor without being referred to the ordinary tribunal and without being hampered by the technical requirements as to a proper formula or kind of action, he himself determining both the law and facts of the case. So two people showed up to the prairator, he told them their story, and he decided who was right. Didn't have a jury, you know. The complainant stated the facts in his case, the defendant set up his defense, the prairator decided. This extraordinary method of determining suits, so simple, so free from technicalities, so easily molded into exigencies of every case, was found so superior to even the improved formulas that eventually it superseded them and became the only mode of procedure. Much as in many of the states and in England, the procedure by bill and answer has supplemented the rigor formulas of common law actions. The man just told you they're using equity against you when they take you to court. They're not looking for money. Really, that's all law can give you is money. Everything else is equity. <laughs> not only were the pleadings thus simplified by the Roman jurist, but the law was correspondingly improved. And a deliberate and persistent effort was made to bring their jurisprudence into perfect harmony with an absolute impartial equity that should do equal and perfect justice to all. And thus was perf perfected that system of jurisprudence known as the civil law, from which are derived many of the maxims, principles, doctrines of equity, now followed and forced by the chancery courts. So th the chancery courts enforce the maxims of equity. And basically, equity just took over for all the other courts because it was much simpler. That's why there's no they're using they're using equity against us. When you go to court, there's no jury there. You're in a court of equity. And if you were to go look at that two-letter code that they have uh, in a court case and go find the code book for your state to see what it is, you know you're going to find these for are cases having something to do with something other than money, right? Like an ejectment. <laughs> kick you off your property, right? They're not asking for money. They're trying to get you booted off some property. The, the problem is, you know, <clears throat> the system is there and there's ungodly people that are using it against you. They believe, right, that they can go in church and pray all day Sunday and be forgiven of their sins and then all week long they can pray on you. 
I don't know where they got that idea from, but apparently that's what they think. Because they do it every week. Yet they would say they're Christians. You'll find them in the golden palaces singing their hearts out on Sunday. I, I watched a couple of videos here, and there was a guy up there talking, and the reason I stopped, I was looking for stuff on civil law, and I said there was this judge talking about civil law, and he was in plain clothes. I said, okay, we well, talking to a group. You know, maybe this would be a little looser. He'll let something out. <laughs> well, as it turned out, he was talking about numerous forms of law in this seminar over a weekend, and he's standing there in a church talking about it. Well, this seminar went, must have gone on for two days, and so the next day they have another speaker up there, and his words were at the beginning was, and I can't remember the guy's name. We're going to call him uh, Jones, right? He says, I wish Bishop Jones, I mean Judge Jones, was here today. Right? That, that judge is a bishop in some religion. Well, it ain't the freaking Roman Catholic religion. Their bishops don't go sit in courtrooms. This was a judge in Tennessee who was a bishop in a certain Protestant sect, for lack of a better term. Some Christian sect. I can't remember what it was. Church of God or something. And a lady told me down in, uh, she's in North Carolina, that she's was in a foreclosure. She's in a foreclosure. <laughs> and the judge in her case is a, you know, minister. He's up there at the pulpit on Sunday and, you know, in there taking your property every day of the week. I don't know what religion that is and how you can call that Christian, but there you go. So, the uh, evolution of equity in England, development of extraordinary jurisdiction the Chancery Court of England was similar in its causes and progress and results to the development of the system of equity in Roman law already initiated or intimated the, in England the king was regarded as the fountain of justice and when any person conceived that he had been wronged either in a court or out of court he had the privilege of petitioning the king for redress the king <clears throat> being able to hear and determine all those all of these complaints because of their number and complexity, complexity, generally referred to them to his chief secretary, who was called his chancellor. This officer was an ecclesiastic. <laughs> Go figure, he was a bishop or a monk. Trained in the law and theology of, law of Rome. Yeah, he was a Roman Catholic bishop or monk, and sometimes called the keeper of the king's conscience. When thus directed to adjudicate the rights and determine the remedies of those petitioning the king for justice, the chancellor naturally had resource, recourse to the civil law of Rome, being the most, being most familiar therewith, and also finding therein a diviner sort of justice and a simpler, more efficient form of procedure. Besides, these chancellors, who were generally very able and learned men, were no doubt disposed to regard the English common law as a barbarous code compared with the Roman civil law. Again, Roman civil law was really, really tweaked out, right? Well administ administered. <laughs> the Chancellor's office was one of the great trust and confidence. He was the king's advisor and confidant, the chief member of his council, and the keeper of his great seal of state. He is spoken of at a very early day as one who annuls unjust laws and executes the commands of a pious prince and puts an end to what is injurious to the people or to morals. Character of the first chancery suits. The chancellor, following example of Roman pray raiders, so again, uh, when the Roman Emperor became Christian, he was still the Emperor, right? And he just used the, the church where his, they were the most learned men around, right? So they were doing all these, uh, um, had all these offices in the Empire. And, you know, they're, they're trying to get people to quit killing each other and trying to change the laws and bring peace because, really, equity is just the New Testament. The Old Testament is common law, very, very rigid rules without much room to move. Equity is everything other than that. Perfect example is when they bring the uh, adulteress to Jesus. And according to the old law, common law of the Old Testament, she needs to be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? We know the story, right? By the time he was done, everybody who thought they were going to throw a rock left because they had all sinned also. 
Well, that was an equitable remedy to a situation where the common law had a very rigid penalty. Boom. Equity was born. <laughs> Application to attain redress for injuries and acts of oppression were from the power where from the power of the offender or for any other cause a fair trial in ordinary courts could not be had. Okay, because of the power of the offender, right? Because these common law courts are all uh, headed by lords, right? The landowners. Well, they're going to look out for their own. And the laws for common law are written by the legislature. They write the laws. And so they can write a law that says, well, if you have the legal title in your hand, you're the owner. And don't put comma unless you got it by fraud. They don't put that in there. So cases where fraud, deceit, dishonesty, beyond the reach of the common law, because the common law doesn't care about fraud. Doesn't care about deceit, doesn't care about dishonesty. It says you got the legal title in your hand, you're the owner. Cases where the common law was inadequate to re requirements of justice and those ties of disorder and oppression, many of these appeals to the king by the poor and the weak for protection against the rich and strong, the local magistrate often being over overawed, and many were the complaints of want of remedy at law. So basically, the ma local magistrates were owned by the lords, and the only place you could get a fair shake is to go see the bishop. <laughs> the king, unable to give personal attention to so many petitions, finally conferred upon the chancellor full authority to give relief in all matters of grace. And as these applications for redress were termed, as these applications for redress were termed, and from this period petitions began to be addressed to the chancellors themselves, and not to the king. This delegation of authority was made in the year 1348, and in the next 50 years, equity jurisdiction of the chancellor was clearly established. Principles on which the early chancellors acted. <laughs> when matters of grace were thus referred to the chancellor, he issued a writ commanding the party <coughs> complained against to appear and answer the complaint and abide by the order of the court. The principles of which the Chancellor based his decision were those of honesty, equity, and conscience. By conscience was meant those obligations one person is under to another to exercise that good faith the other has a right to expect. <coughs> On an application to Parliament for redress, the petition was referred to the Chancellor with the command, let there be done by authority of Parliament that which right and reason and good faith and good conscience demand in the case. Matters of grace being thus brought before the Chancellor, the keeper of the King's conscience, and he being required to do justice in the King's name, he felt no obligation to determine the rights of petitioners by the law from which they had fled to the King for relief. Didn't care what the law said. And, for reasons already stated, the chancellors at a very early day adopted the equitable principles and simple procedures of civil law of Rome, adopt, adapting them with wisdom, prudence to the emergencies of a particular case. The matter referred to them being matters of grace and of conscience, conscience the chancellors felt bound to decide the cause according to conscience. The jurisdiction of the Chancellor being thus established upon grace and conscience, and his judgments being in the name of the King, and by his authority whenever the courts of common law were inadequate to demands of justice, the party unable to obtain relief therein would have recourse to the Chancellor, <coughs> who in his court, <coughs> called the High Court of Chancery of England, undertook, like the Prairator of Rome, to administer an equity not found in law, himself determining all questions both of law and fact, and rendering a de decree adapted to all the exigencies, exigencies of, of justice. The common law was compared with the civil law. The common law was utterly incapable of doing complete justice in any case, and not in few cases it furnished no remedy or relief whatsoever, or whatever. It had a certain rigid molds and formulas into some of which every cause of action had to be cast, and if the cause could not run into these molds, there was no redress. And if it could not run into, 
if it could run into one of the molds and only redress as a formula could be had, uh, regardless of the equities of the case and the real rights of the parties, had very, very few answers and very rigid um, set of rules you had to follow. The fictions, formalities, and arbitrary techniques, technicalities of the common law and its dialectical refinements were inexplicable and incomprehensible jargon to the public and often a costly mockery of justice to the litigants. Jeepers! I wonder if that's ever happened. <coughs> Those who asked for bread were often given a stone. Those who applied for fish sometimes received a serpent. You're looking for justice. <laughs> You're lucky to have your case dismissed. Now, it isn't in here, but in another book, um, in fact, it's in the Order of the Coif, I think they're talking about it. Back in the uh, mid to late 1800s, Parliament passed some laws that said, okay, common law courts, you can have this equitable jurisdiction, limited. Courts of equity, you can have this limited common law jurisdiction. So you could be going to a common law court and they could be using equity against you because they have, again, this is Parliament making the rules. And why are they making these rules? So the lords can take your property. Right? The temporal lords. Equity, on the other hand, disregarded forms, ignores fictions, subordinate technicalities, as to requirements of justice, and indulged in no dialectical refinements. i got to find out what that word means. In its pleadings, pleadings, right, we're doing pleadings, were simple and natural, and its doctrines were founded on external principles of right as interpreted by lofty Christian morality. Its great underlying principle, the constant sources, the never-failing roots of its particular rules were the principles of equity, the maxims, justice, morality, and honesty, enforced according to conscience and good faith, and so adapted to the requirements of each case and the complications of business affairs that the rights and duties of all parties were fully determined. It's why we need to go through chancery with our pleadings. You don't take it to the court, the, the common law court side of the court. You need to get into chancery. Find out how you put in a civil action. Put in a pleading. <coughs> Some of the deficiencies of common law. The, the common law then was, uh, was not what it has since become under benign inspiration of the chancery jurisprudence, right? Now they're talking about these things that the common law has been given. But at first it didn't have this. At common law, a vendor's lien could not be enforced. A fraudulent conveyance could not be set aside. A defective instrument could not be reformed. A mistake or accident could not effectually be effectually relieved against. A debt, note, or account could not be assigned. A resulting trust could not be set up. Beneficial interest in property could not be enforced. Void instrument could not be canceled, and, and, and. As you can see, all these have something to do with other than money. Looking for some kind of performance in one kind of another, that's what <coughs> the courts of equity do through chancery. Some of those powers have been given to common law, and it's probably out of these, the ones they use against us, to take our property. A deed could not be declared a mortgage. Well, go figure. Look at that. A deed cannot be declared a mortgage. Well, now they can. Right? They take a deed of trust and they call it a mortgage. Title to land cannot effectually be quieted. Waste, trespass, and other violations right cannot be stayed. A forfeiture or penalty could not be relieved against. Set off could not be attained. Land could not be redeemed from a mortgage. A lien on re realty could not be enforced. What good was common law, right? There was nothing to use it for. It didn't have anything to... If you had any of these problems, you didn't have a remedy in common law. So, anyways, there's a bunch of them. How the law has followed equity. Under the influence of principles of equity as administered in chancery, the rugged features of the common law have grown constantly more and more smooth and humane, 
and its capacity to do justice has constantly increased. The evolution of the law in England and America has been on the lines marked out by equity until the language of Lord Hale by the growth of equity on equity the heart of the common law has been has been eaten out to show the effect of principles and doctrines of equity upon our own statutes because the statutes do make up the common law it's uh, common law is the uh, um, the customs and the statutes make common law So, because of that, now the, these things are covered in law. The, the law in reference to gambling and wagering, the whole law of landlords, mechanics, laborers, and other liens, law of notice through registration of deeds. They kifed the powers of chancery, took it to the law side of the court, administered by the lords, who only have the desire to stay in power, and they're taking our stuff. Garnishment, ejectment, the right to defend by title bond as by deed, yeah, you know, all sorts of things that the, that the legislature got together and said, okay, how can we screw the people? Yeah, we can do this, this. That's why all the, the all these compiled laws are written, all this other stuff is written to allow them to use equity to take your stuff and not break the law or so they say however they broke the law once they did it in bad faith what they don't want us to do is figure out what door to go to to get remedy because we won't get remedy going to the common law door right you need to go through chancery <coughs> the divine law of justice the rule of decision the statement also made that the Court of Chancery was established to mitigate the rigor of the common law and supply its defects is not wholly true. The Court was established to do, just, to do justice regardless of any and all law. It only has one job. The Court of Chancery has one job, to do justice. The King deemed it duly imposed upon his conscience both by his oath and by religion to decree justice and in decreeing justice he deemed himself bound rather by the divine law than by human law and when the chancellor acted in his stead he based his decisions not upon the law of the land but upon honesty equity and conscience well if if honesty equity and conscience aren't part of the law of the land and you know that's what they're using against us we don't want to do with the law of the land I'm gonna go for honesty equity and conscience so far as he commanded to do in exercising the king's prerogative of grace. In short, the chancery courts was established rather as a court based on the precepts of religion than as a court based on the rules of law. It is unquestionably true that the harshness of the common law, its unfitness to cope with fraud, its incapacity to do justice in many cases, the defects in its remedies, the opportunities it gave the strong to oppress the weak, and its general inadequacy to meet the requirements of equity greatly contributed to the perpetuate to perpetuate the existence of the chancery court and to enlarge the and justify its jurisdiction nevertheless the vital principle from which the court sprung was the prerogative doctrine of the king was the fountain of justice and that when a citizen could not get justice in ordinary courts he might come to this fountain. The king, in administering justice in such cases, deemed himself above all the laws and customs of his realm and bound only to his conscience and his will. As it is not a matter of right in a citizen to draw on this reserve source of justice, when remedy was given, it was deemed granted as of grace. Yeah, it's all about faith and sin and uh, it's in this book here suits and chancery and uh, you know that, th this is just the telling about the book without even getting into what the book talks about but this is supposed to have all the pleadings in it and stuff and uh, you know I was reading out of part one the history so then you got jurisdiction of the chancery court maxims and principles of equity 
If you know those, that's really all you need to know. We can use anything else we want, but, you know, it's based on the principles or the maxims of equity. <coughs> well, what was that about bonafide? Priorities and a bonafide purchaser. Bonafide, good faith purchaser. Well, we haven't had much good faith showing our way. Parties to a suit in Chancery, original bills in Chancery, proceedings preliminary to process, original process in Chancery, so forth and so on. So, anyways, there's a group of us. This is what we're trying to do. I, I've already been told I'm crazy for trying it, that all the courts have been dissolved and, you know. Well, to, to me, somebody's trying to be a prophet, right? They haven't tried it yet, but they already know it's not going to work. Well, that's being a prophet, and that's just silly, right? I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm going to go find out for myself. It's just the way it is. So, but I'm going to do it based on what I read, right? I'm showing people what I read and say, well, this is what it says. Let's go see what it does. <laughs> so we'll see. Rose got hers in. Now she's got a motion in to, uh, she put a motion in for uh, a declaratory judgment. And she went to the same uh, county courthouse that she went to put in the original um, petition. And when she went into room 160, where the chancery was, where she put the petition in, they said, well, you need to go upstairs to room 260. And went upstairs to 260, and it was really just a window. And uh, that's where she put her petition in to ask for a declaratory judgment based on the preponderance of the evidence and the fact that the bank has not signed the deed of trust, therefore there is no contract. It's not an agreement. Sorry, that's not going to work in chancery and to get specific performance on the warranty deed which is a sales contract which now we have acknowledged and we want to have the thing lawfully executed and that you know we paid closing agents to do this they haven't done their job let's finish the contract and hand me the title deed that shows that I'm an assigned back to the original land patent and now I don't have any taxes I got the damn piece of paper Right now, you're a joint tenant because somebody else is holding the title deed to your property. You have equitable title because you're on it. They got legal title because they got the piece of paper. And we're going to get that piece of paper back, merge the titles, just be the owner. So, and we got some other things that we're thinking about doing, but baby steps, right? Crawl, walk, run. Still crawling. See you guys.